Well, good morning and happy Canada Day. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are blessed that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We are blessed to live in a free country like Canada. I think of all the wars that have been going on this past year um, just reminds us how much uh, freedom we have here, and we cannot take that for granted. So whether you were born in Canada or your parents immigrated here, you have immigrated here, uh, just um, exciting to have you with us and to be a part of our service this morning. And would you stand with us as we sing our national anthem? As we begin and continue this morning, would you read these words from Psalm 95 with us together? O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Would you pray? Father God, thank you again for the freedom that we have to live in this country. Thank you that we can come and we can praise your name together corporately without fear of persecution this morning, God. We pray that we would never take that freedom lightly. So we praise your name this morning. We extol who you are. We come into your gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, God. Help us this morning, despite uh, how our hearts feel, Lord, that you would have your Holy Spirit work in each one of our hearts to worship you and in our minds, God, to receive your word this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and together we said, amen. Let's sing these songs together.
Amen. Amen. Well, after the message this morning, we will be celebrating communion together. And this song just speaks of the great love that uh, Jesus has for us and, um, and the sacrifice that he made. So I just want to read um, these verses from Ephesians chapter 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's sing this together.
hope. Jesus, you're the only hope. Jesus, hope for all the world. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. If you look on stage behind me, you might see some of our new decorations. They're really just our camp set up, our team banners. If you look on the team names, you can see probably some names you don't know how to pronounce, and it took me a couple of years also to be able to pronounce them, but I think I have them down now. And they are all um, Greek or Hebrew words that mean strength or power, and our name, Makasa, is a word that means refuge. And when we think about those words, that's our hope and prayer for our teams um, this summer at camp. You can come up with me, Ezra. Ezra's coming to camp this week. We're really excited. And Makasa means refuge. And more than we want to provide a place of refuge and safety, we want to teach them that God is our refuge, that he is our hope and our strength. And that is our prayer this week for all of the kids who come and for Ezra. And Ezra, will you hold my hand? I want to pray for our camp. We're going to pray for our kids this week, for Ezra and for lots of other kids like Ezra who maybe it's their first time to hear about God's love or something that they've heard in their house, but it can be reinforced. And it's just my prayer that they will leave knowing even 1% more about God, that uh, we will be just a small part of their discipleship journey. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for... Um, kids and the joy that they can be to be around and the smiles and fun that it can be uh, to spend time with them. And I just pray especially that you will open their hearts to hear from you, that you will be with our teachers and leaders, that you will um, give us creative ways to speak to them in ways that they will understand and that will penetrate their hearts, that they will leave change, leave knowing more about you, and that you will use us to be um, just a part of their discipleship journey, that we will be making disciples out of Ezra and out of all of uh, the kids that come, and that we will raise up just a generation of children who are just so passionate about their love for you that it will continue to grow and grow in our community. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're headed downstairs. Well, there will be a lot of excitement uh, this week in the building. And I just want to remind you that there are connection cards in front of the chairs um, in front of you. And if you're a newcomer, we'd love to just uh, know of your visit today. And if you're a regular attender, uh, please use it as a, um, you can write a prayer request on there. Or maybe you just have um, questions about a ministry that we're doing. Um, please just fill that in and someone from the staff will be happy to uh, get back to you. And also, because it's the first Sunday of the month, this is our benevolent uh, Sunday. And so if you feel so inclined um, and you're able to give a little bit extra this week or this month, um, we do have the offering uh, box at the back, and you can still give online. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, we're going to sing a song before Pastor Carl comes and uh, brings the word to us this morning. So would you stand?
you, Heavenly Father. Just thank you, Father, for what you have done for us. Thank you that we can praise you for endless days here on earth and here above if our faith and our trust is in you. Please open our, our hearts, God. Please allow your Holy Spirit to have its way in us so that we can hear from Pastor Carl what you have us to learn. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I always wonder if, there's, if you're new and you're just you know, attending the first time or something, what is it like to show up at a church and find out they're preaching through all the verses of Revelation? That's got to be, a, you know, you're hoping for something easy, like, I don't know. I don't know. There's no easy. Anyway, I don't apologize for it, though, because it's been challenging but fruitful. So we're, I'm going to read chapter 10 of Revelation to us. And um, remember, after chapter 9, things are pretty gr grim. And one of the things you're going to notice is that after the sixth, between the sixth and seventh seal being opened, between the sixth and seventh trumpet being sounded and the sixth and seventh bowl being poured out, there's a little interlude of varying length. And that interlude is always aimed at encouraging the church. It's almost as if God knows the first six seals are so miserable, the first six trumpets are so difficult to swallow that he needs to encourage us. And so that's what this is. This is the interlude, and there's uh, an encouragement here. So let's read that. It's chapter 10 of Revelation, verses 1 to 11. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his leg, legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded, and when the seven thunders said, had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and, sorry, and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I heard, had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told... You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Okay, so this week I was reading uh, lots of stuff, but one of them was the New York Times. And there's an article this week in the New York Times by a woman who is a psychologist. Her name is Mary Piffer. And she's lamenting and talking about how anxious, how anxious she is, how the times right now are really difficult. And she's trying to figure out how do you, how do you cope in a world that seems so grim. And here is what she wrote. Of course, I am leading a double life. Underneath my ordinary good life, I'm in despair for the world. Some days, the news is such that I need all my inner strength to avoid exhaustion, anxiety, and depression. I rarely discuss this despair. My friends don't either. We all feel the same. We don't know what to say that is positive. So we keep our conversations to our gardens, our families, books, and movies, and our work on local projects. We don't want to make one another feel hopeless and helpless. Many of us feel we are walking through, sp through sludge. This strange inertia comes from the continuing pandemic, a world at war, and the mass shootings of shoppers, worshipers, and school children. In addition, our country and our planet are rapidly changing in ways that are profoundly disturbing. We live in a time of groundlessness when we can, resent, we can, reasonably, predi sorry, when we can reasonably predict no further than dinner time. The pandemic was a crash course in that lesson. And so Mary Piffer captures what a lot of people 
are struggling with. We know anxiety is through the roof, has been increasing for, for a decade, and it really has accelerated in this last couple of years. Um, and as a result, it's interesting, we, we kind of mock people who read horoscopes uh, and go to fortune tellers and read tarot cards, and yet these things are not only on the rise, but so are secular fortune tellers, and they call them futurists. So a futurist is somebody who, often from a business perspective, you know, they still use the totems and rituals of religion, but they use secular ones. So instead of using a Bible and tarot cards, they instead use things like uh, newspapers, economic charts and graphs and trends. And they predict, they try to predict what the world will look like in a few years from now and beyond. And oftentimes they're hired by businesses because businesses want to know, hey, what should I be doing to make sure I don't lose my edge? I don't want to be blockbuster video, right? So we have these futurists who peer out into the future. But even they struggle and know that they can't actually predict the future. See, because people like Mary Piffer and all of us, we're trying to figure out how do we not freak out? How do we not get angry about everything? How do we not think that every little time the government does something, they're trying to pull our rights away? How do we become a normal, peaceful, restful people? And one of these futurists who's probably the most popular in the world is a guy named Kevin Kelly. And he was the guy who founded and was the head editor of Wired.com. He may have been on the website. Bright guy, really intelligent guy. And he, in November of last year, put a tweet out. And his tweet admits a problem with futurists. Here's what he said. The futurist's dilemma. Any believable prediction will be wrong because the future will not be reasonable. It will be weird, see now. But any correct prediction will be unbelievable today because that world doesn't seem reasonable. Either way, a futurist can't win. He's right. You know, we've, we've advanced so much in technology and in so many different ways, but not just technology, we've advanced in sin. They've, they seem to have gone at the same rate. And as a result, the future is increasingly unpredictable. Because yes, lots of things are possible and capable for the good, but we have such a really good mind and heart for perverting good things that the future couldn't be just as radically evil as it could be good. And so, he's right. There's no actual hope for peace in, in this world except for, we think, I think, the biblical response to the world and to this uncertainty. It's the only one that provides uh, an answer that isn't skewed. We'll try to show that here a little bit now. Um, and specifically, the Bible says this, and this passage deals with this uncertainty. Because remember, we're talking about a time in these uh, trumpets when Christ says, says, as the world continues to march towards its, the end, it's going to get worse. And in that mo time, everything will seem uncertain, but there's certain things that are certain. And those few things you can be certain about are enough to allow you to have peace in the world when nobody else is, to be able to see clearly when the rest of the world seems blind. And they're clearly on display in this passage, in this interlude between the seals. And so the three things we're going to quickly try to see today is we're being, sh we're being told as the church that there's something that we can know that will help us, something we must do, and something that we can get. Okay? Something we know, must do, and get. So something we can know. So as I said, we saw in chapter 9 that, in, not in effect, literally, the hell is opened up and permitted to have a certain degree of freedom in the world to influence and to distort and to mislead in the world. And we see the effects of that. I think Mary Piffer covers some of that. And if that is true, if there is a power out and unleashed in the world that desires your destruction and downfall, then you have every reason to behave like Mary Piffer. She's responding exactly the way, the way the world ought to respond without Christ. Hopeless, despair, struggling, anxiety, always worrying. And so, the opposite, however, is being told to us all through, not just the Bible, but Revelation seems really intent on showing you that there is a God who is sovereign and enthroned. And every few verses, it seems like there's a reminder. I know it looks dark, but remember, he is king. He is king. It looks, it's, it's the great and wonderful Oz. Remember, you pull back the curtain, and you see what's really happening. It looks like everything is spinning out of control, but there is a sovereign God. And you see it in this passage, in this form of this angel that shows up right at the start. So we're going to talk about the angel. What he, who he is and what he does is important to make sure that we have the certainty 
that we don't feel like the world is running off the rails. So who is this angel, first off? Now, there's always debate. Just so you know, every verse in Revelation has debate, just about. So people question the identity. Who is this angel? There's essentially three approaches. I'm not going to outline them all, because there's really one that everybody, I think, is right to choose. He's an angel. He's not Jesus, and he's not the Holy Spirit. Now, I understand why people say it, but let me just show really quickly why we think this is an angel and why it's important. The first thing is, he is called an angel. <laughs> Pretty basic. But when Jesus shows up in the, in the book of Revelation, they refer to him as the Son of Man. There's other ways of identifying him. But even more importantly is the wording used in Greek. At the very start of the chapter, John says he turns and he sees another angel. And that word another is the word alos in Greek. And it is a word that means something of the same kind uh, as. Okay? So if I'm walking through the grocery store and I see some apples, I would say, ah, there's some fruit. And if right next to it there was bananas, I would say, ah, there's another piece of fruit. Same kind, they're both fruit, different kinds, but same form, the, source, the same thing, the fruit. If it was an apple and then I saw a dish detergent, I would say in Greek, ah, there is apple and there is a heteros, a different thing. And every time John and the Bible uses this word alos, it's speaking of another of the same kind. So he doesn't see something that isn't an angel, He's seeing an angel, okay? That may sound big, but it's important, okay? It's this angel shows up. And not just that, look at how he's, he's clothed. And you're probably getting used to the weird imagery and the symbolism a little in Revelation. Now, the symbolism is meant to hammer home the fact that God is present, okay? So he shows up and he's in, enshrouded in this cloud. So you know from Exodus and Lamentations, many places, when God shows up, in the temple, in the tabernacle, he is a cloud, the presence of God. When he's helping Israel through the wilderness, he is a pillar of fire and cloud. So he's present. Not just that, he is this rainbow over him. Remember what we've talked about the rainbow before? Genesis 9. It's this covenant. So God is present. He is there. He hasn't forgotten his promise to care for and not destroy the world in a certain way and so on. So there's grace. There's God present. His legs are these fiery pillars, which again protection and presence of God, which you see in Exodus when he's leading them through the wilderness. And so this angel is clearly not God, but he is there as a, as a messenger of God, like chapter 5, the last time you heard about a mighty angel, the exact same wording. And he's to show God is present. But then look at what he does, which is fascinating. He comes and he stands with his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. Some people think he's on the Mediterranean looking at Israel, right? Mediterranean, right? And then... Israel, maybe. That is quite irrelevant as to whether he is or not. We don't know. What we do know is that all through the Old Testament and the ancient world, it was understood that when you said something about where your foot was treading, it meant you owned that thing. So God in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 11, for instance, says to, says to Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. See, everything you're stepping on is yours. To Joshua, he says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you given to you, just as I promised Moses. And you even see it make its way into the rituals of Israel. You've all read Ruth. I, again, I feel sorry for ladies. All your Bible studies are Ruth or Esther. I don't know. I, I feel, I'm, I'm sorry. They're really good books, but there's other parts that apply to women. Anyway, side note. So Ruth, there's a little part of Ruth chapter 4 that no one ever realizes. He explains, or, or the writer explains, a ritual that when Boaz goes to redeem Ruth and, and take her as his wife and get the land that was Naomi's, the transaction is finalized with a sandal. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning, the re concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. And the idea was this other guy, not Boaz, but the other person who he was uh, taking the role of redeemer, kinsman redeemer, off of. Uh, he said, you want the land? Do you want Ruth? He takes off his sandal and he hands it to Boaz. Symbolically, what he's saying is, this land that was mine because I tread upon it is now yours. And so, when an angel shows up and he straddles the known world, remember, we're talking about a smaller world in those days is what they understood, and he has a foot on the water, meaning he stands on water as well, and another foot on the land, he is saying, I have authority over all of it. I can do as I please. I can accomplish everything I'm expected to do. So, 
In other words, he has all the power. Not what you just saw in chapter 9. I know it looks crazy. Remember? There's this devil, this beast, this creature who's doing things. And he's coming saying, I know it looks crazy, but God remains enthroned. And then he roars like a lion. I don't know if it's popular or not, but did you know a lion never roars before he attacks? Because he likes to sneak up on things. Um, and that would be like foolish. Oh, no, you jump on the thing, right? It wouldn't make a lot of sense. So a lion actually only roars for usually one of two reasons, but the primary reason is to, to warn you. He has this land, his territory, and he roars when he sees something coming into it to say, this is mine, do not come unless you're prepared to be killed. So it's a warning, it's a territorial thing. So when this angel comes in the presence of God, straddling the known world and roaring, he is saying, I have authority over it. It is mine, not this thing that's come from the pit. None of that has authority over all things, only God. So it's a sense of assurance. It's this, um, this certainty that we are asked to have. God has no rivals, right? There's this, um, I'm not suggest when I, when I quote something, please don't think I'm always saying go ahead and read it or watch it. But there's a show on Netflix, and every time I see a movie or a show that talks about God or theology, or even if it's a comedy, I'll watch it, and, or at least part of it. We'll see how bad it is. Um, only because I like to know how the world is thinking about the things of God and see how they're getting it wrong, because you begin to see the thread all through about how the world doesn't understand the gospel. It's foolishness. And there's a show right now on Netflix called God's Favorite Idiot. Now, I'm not saying watch it. Please don't think that. However, there's interesting, it, it covers, it has basically the same line of, you'd see in a million different movies, meaning the guy has been chosen, has been chosen by God. He's not a Christian, he's just a normal guy. He's been chosen by God to do something for uh, this end time scenario. Because as they say in the, in the show, there's the, the war is raging in heaven. But here's the part that they say that everybody gets wrong if they're not a Christian, and unfortunately many Christians. It says... Listen, there's a battle going on in heaven between the devil, Lucifer, and, Satan, and, and, and God, and the, and the outcome is in the balance, it says. Is it, we're still, you know, we're, we're not sure where it's going to go. You can tip the balance. See how humanistic, see how secular it is? Everything in the world comes down to this guy. And this is the view that many people in the world think. They think there's a reason. See, what it's doing is it's saying, carry on being anxious because the end isn't certain, so you better worry about it, right? And that's exactly the problem that's going on, which Mary Piffer is pointing out in the world. Because there's an uncertainty about the end and who's in control, there is rapid, just crazy anxiety, anger, frustration. When anybody loses an election, they feel like they've, la they've lost something. Why? Because they believe that decision is the one that will tip everything in favor of good or evil. Because they lack the perspective that John is trying to show us all through the book of Revelation, they rage. And they think that there's a battle that is not as uncertain. And the point of all of Revelation, and right here with this angel, is to say there is no rival to God. There is no serious rival. There's no question about the outcome. It is final. It is decided. People don't like predestination. You better like it right now. It is decided that the end is chosen. It is finished. And that is peace to us, you see. It is peace. We need to know that it all isn't going to come down to how faithful I am or how faithful you are because then I don't need to be anxious about the next day because I know it's taken care of. And so the first part, as much as I would like to obviously go on, is what can we know? That God is sovereign, which I think I've said every sermon. God is sovereign. That's the first point. That's what we can know. Second thing is, what can we do, or what, not, what we must do, not what we can do, what we must do. So, when, if God is sovereign over all things, his sovereignty extends to humanity. And it means that Christians then, very put, a quick definition, a Christian is somebody who acknowledges God's sovereignty. We say, yes, God is king over all, and we believe it, and we're going to submit to him as king. That's what a Christian is. Now, if he is sovereign over all, the Christian has to confess this, he has a claim on us. He has a claim. Because he has bought us with a price, we are his, and he can make demands of us, like that or not. I know it's uncomfortable for some. It shouldn't be, unless you think he's a tyrant. But he's not a tyrant. Because if God had come and said, on the other hand, if you obey, then 
I'll save you, then he might be a tyrant because he demands payment for salvation. But when he comes and says, I've saved you, now because it's freely, you've been saved freely, now obey, he's not a tyrant. It's the right response of the grateful heart is to obey the sovereign Lord. And so, if that, let me use an example this way. Most people work. Um, if I get my paycheck here, I don't run to the elders and say, thank you for the paycheck. I don't do that. Not because I'm not grateful, but because I earned the paycheck. Right? That's what we all do. You don't go thank your employer, usually. You go and you just take it. So if your employer was to come to you and say, hey, now that you've got the money, could you, would you mind donating some back to the company, buying shares, giving to this charity, funding this political party? What would you say? No. I earn that money. You have no claim on what I do with that money. However, God says that's not the way the world works as far as salvation goes. He has saved you. And as a result, he has a claim on you. So he can say, now that you are saved, I have won you to myself. I bought you for me. Now go and do this. And this is what being a disciple is. He calls you into him radically in, and then he sends you radically out. And if that's the case, what is it that he has called us to do? And this is an important one, important point. Because there's a lot of, I mean, we all do it. We all think we're committed to God until he asks a little too much, right? We all think we're committed disciples until he asks for that one thing that you're not necessarily willing to sacrifice and give to him because we have limited discipleship for him, right? Limited love. So if he demands all of it, think about Abraham. Who here would lay their son on an altar to kill them? Anyone? And yet... We preach it, and you probably say, amen, when I preach it, but would you do it? No, you probably wouldn't, and I'm not so sure I would. It's very difficult, but this is the demand of a sovereign God who has bought you with a price. He says, I want it all for me. I can't let you keep anything, and if you, and all of us have to do this, myself included, what is that one thing that we think, if it was taken from me, if God demanded this of me, I would have to say, ooh, enough is enough. I'll give you my time, I'll give you my money, I'll give you whatever, but not this. It's that meatloaf song. I'll do anything for God, but not that. Remember that meatloaf song? It's not about God. But. See, there's that. And whatever that thing is that you think, I can't give him that, that is what's got its hooks in you. That's the idol that he needs to especially root out of you. Because he will not allow you to have any rival gods. And if that's the case, when he then comes to Isaiah, or Isaiah well, Isaiah 2 is a good example, Isaiah 6. Um, and he comes to John and he says, here's, this, here's what you're going to do now. You're going to take this scroll and you're going to eat it. And then you're going to prophesy. In other words, you're going to take it and you're going to tell everybody what it is that, you, that you've taken in. Okay? Now, you've been saved from wrath for a mission. You have to have both of those as in your church. Whatever church, if this is your home church, you'll hear it here. If this isn't and you go to another church, whatever church tells you that it's only one of those two, will make you an unbalanced Christian. You are saved from wrath, which means you have an obligation to God. But you have not been saved by wrath so you can sit on the deck and sip brandy and just enjoy your life. You've been saved for a mission because he, he wants you to be involved in what he is doing in the world because that's how you're shaped and sharpened and so on. And so he goes, and this is very similar to what you read in Ezekiel 2 and 3 because he's told to eat the scroll and then tell Israel all about it. And what he, the symbolism is very simple. The scroll is the scroll that we see Jesus open. Chapter 5, it shows up, and so on. So what's written on that scroll, if you remember? It's God's intent for the world. It's his interpretation of history. It's his, it points to mercy and how to find hope and salvation. It's everything. It's God's plan. That is what he, John, and we are being told. In this time when the world is going out of whack, I have pulled you out, and now your job is to take the word of God to ingest it, which means to trust it to nourish you, to allow it to transform you, because that you are what you eat thing is kind of true, and then let it become the very message, everything that you do. And this is what he is demanding of us. The prof and I said this in the very first sermon, which I don't expect you to remember, but maybe I do, is this. The prophetic message of Jesus Christ becomes the prophetic witness of the church. The very thing Christ tells the church is meant for us to then take and then be our message out. He doesn't just give this message to make you uh, happy, to give you a couple more years of life. It's to turn us into him of sorts, right? Messengers for him. So as a result, it's understandable then, sorry, that the message 
is going to be sweet and bitter. It'll be sweet to you and I because it's a message that talks about our salvation, right? It's pretty sweet. But it's going to be bitter because the world, that you know what's in this message as well? Judgment and demands. Because God doesn't just roar over the church, he roars over the universe and says, it's mine. And you all owe me obedience and you haven't done it. And so because it makes radical demands on the world and they don't want to submit, it's not going to be a, a pleasant message for everybody. They're going to rage against it, Psalm 2. And as a result, well, they, it's not going to be just a bitter message for those who hear it, but for you and I, because they're going to identify us with that message. It's not just going to be it's what Carl is saying, it's who Carl is. Have you ever been at a picnic and you break out the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the guy next to you brings out the alfalfa sprouts and the organic food? So how do you feel? You're like, and right away you justify it. You say, yeah, he's eating well, but he probably has more money. He's got more time. Or he's probably a bad husband, you know. He wasn't a good dad. I bet you he didn't swim with the kids this week. You begin to justify it. And if you and I are behaving like Christ in the world, we are going to be the alfalfa sprout guy. We're going to be the ones that people look at and say, just by our lives, they're going to say, look at how repulsive they are. Because the more you and I look and smell like our Savior, the more the world will reject us as they reject him. And so it's bitter for everybody, as well as sweet. And so, and I said this to you before, it might be one of my favorite phrases, we are meant to be the evidence of the past resurrection and the foretaste of the coming resurrection. You and I are meant to be proof that he rose from the grave and evidence of what the coming resurrection will look like. We're supposed to be a, 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 a coming attraction before the movie. This is what the world will look like, caring, forgiving, loving, and so on. Now, so that's what we're called to do. Then, what do we get? So, we have a problem here, because the only way to be this sort of a prophet, to take these words of God and push them back out into the world, is if I have no other cares. Because the cares of the world will make you less Christian. And I mean that not just in your conduct, but in your way of thinking, because you're going to be so worried. Everybody here, I'm sure, has at some point in their lives struggled to pay bills. And every minute that you are focused on simply survival, you are not focused on something else. And if you know that, who, I mean, who can remember? I mean, even in college, who's ever done the, uh, you go to the anywhere and you tap your, you swipe your card and you're like, is it going to go through? Is it going to say approved or not? And you're preparing in your mind the excuse. Oh, well, wrong account or I, I mean, a dog ate my card. You know, how about that anxiety that you have? See, the only way is if you can somehow get what Mary Piffer, Piffer is talking about, have those anxieties of the world ripped away. How do you live in such a way that you can actually rest and have peace despite what's happening in the world. And I'm going to, let's, we're gonna, it'll be a somewhat of a long ending. There's a, Cana it's Canadian week, right? So let's talk about a Canadian author, Lucy Maud Montgomery. She didn't just write uh, Anne of Green Gables, she wrote 530 short stories, over 500 poems, dozens of essays, prolific writer. And one of her poems, here's what she writes, come, Rest a while and let us idly stray in glimmering valleys cool and far away. Come from the greedy mart market and troubled street and listen to the music faint and sweet that echoes ever to a listening ear unheard by those who will not pause to hear. The wayward chimes of memory's pensive bells, wind blown o'er misty hills and curtain, curtain dells. One step aside and dewy buds enclose the sweetness of the violet and the rose. And here's key. You have forgotten what it is to smile. In your too busy life, come, rest a while. She's calling you to rest. And the reason she's doing it is because she realizes something that Mary Piffer and all of us realize. We desperately want peace. We want to be the sort of person who doesn't just ignore the world, because that's easy, right? You can just stick your head in the sand and say, it's not as bad as I think. But we don't want to do that. We want people who see it but yet can be at peace through it. We want to be like Christ sleeping in the boat, right? We want to be able to be in the midst of the storm and not be caught up in it. How, how is it possible? And sometimes we think the way to do it is, you know, if, I, uh, if, I just, if God just removed the circumstance, you know, if, he, if I had more money, I could rest, Lucy. If I had more money, I could go to PEI and live beautifully. But it's not really the, the, the issue. And I'll use one more one more uh, woman as, as well. It's all women, Canada Women's Day. Uh, this isn't a Canadian woman. Judith Shulovitz is a, uh, a, a writer in the United States and Jewish a woman as well. And she realized she hated um, her job. 
she began to work, she was re working in New York and said, you know, I don't like my work. And um, it got to the point where it was affecting everything. She said, it's ironic, I hate my job, and yet I can't stop thinking about it. I can't rest. Even her Sunday brunches or her afternoon brunches with her friends became miserable to her because she would be, she said, you know, over time, those brunches just became an excuse for us to complain or boast about our work. Complain about our work or to talk about how wonderful we were doing compared to everybody else. And she said, there must be something else. There must be a way to rest from this. And she ended up going back to, church, to synagogue with her family and realized that the Sabbath might have the answer that there's for rest. And here's what she wrote. It became a book afterwards, um, but this was the article she started in, in the New York Times as well. In the Sabbath, not only did drudgery give way to festivity, family gatherings, and occasionally worship, but the machinery of self-censorship shut down too, stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. The Sunday neurotic, rather than enjoying his respite, became distraught. He feared that impulses repressed only with great effort might be unleashed. He induced pain or mental anguish to preempt the feeling of being out of control. And what Shulevitz is saying is we don't simply need more free time, more leisure time. That's the, that's the lie. If you watch those, you know, those shows like the, the Housewives of So-and-So, you'll see, you'll see that people with money and time aren't free of stress. It's not that we need more leisure time. We don't need a four-day work week, okay? We don't. What we require is what she brilliantly puts. We need rest from the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach, which means this. Why is it that on a Sunday, or whatever Sabbath, but Sunday, when you email me at home, I can't help but look at it? Why? Why is it that even when I'm supposed to be off, and I'm talking about me, but it's all of us, we can't ever quite turn off? Why is it if you're a small business owner, you justify in your head and say, I know it's a Sabbath, but this is God sending business to me, so I have to answer this email. See? The reason you and I cannot rest is because we cannot rest. We're under the impression that inner, eternal inner murmur in our head says, if you stop, it won't go as you expect. God can't be trusted to provide, so you better. God can't be trusted, so you can't. Think about the Sabbath seventh day. God creates for six days. The seventh day, he ceases from his work to rest, to reflect, to enjoy. The reason you and I should be able to stop on a Sabbath day is we ought to be able to say, no more work needs to be done. I've done everything. I've worked hard for my time. Now I can rest, which means I don't have to do anything else. That voice that says, you better keep working. You better keep working. Somebody's hurting. You better keep working. That internal, eternal inner murmur that says your identity is in how well you respond is a lie. And you don't need rest from the toil of work. You need rest from that voice that says, if I don't worry about the Ukraine, what will happen? If I don't worry about this election and COVID and whatever else, who else is, I can't leave it up to the politicians. So you see, I can't trust the future. I can't leave it in the hands of God. So I've got to fill up that time with a flurry of activity and worry because if I don't do it, who will? And it reveals you don't believe God is sovereign. Now, we're all guilty of it. Every time we do that, we show that we have, for a moment at least, let something else take the throne in our heart. Something else has said, this worry is so important that you can't trust it with God. And we're all guilty of it. And so, at the end, or in the midst of this chapter, when, when the angel, this is what you read, he raises his right hand, the angel, to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Doesn't it sound pretty good to know that the mystery will always, will one day be fulfilled? Meaning, all those questions, why did I die? Or why did so-and-so die? Why did I get sick? Why did I marry this person? Why do I go to this church? <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that one in there. Um, you know, all, but all these mysteries, and there's so many mysteries. How, how do we, we can't un untangle them all. God is saying, there is peace. You have to trust I am in control, and I will have an answer for all of it. And that future peace should, its fingers should come into the present and give you peace now. I don't need to worry about anything. Anything. But I do, right? But I shouldn't have to worry. And he is telling us here, don't you see, the end is certain and has nothing to do with you. 
You can rest because God is sovereign. You don't have to be. Martin Luther, during the Reformation, was so worried that Philip Melanchthon, I think it was Philip said to Martin, or was the other way around, said to him, you're caught up in anxiety. Um, let Luther cease to rule the world. He had to be reminded that the Reformation didn't matter, didn't depend on Luther. It had depended on God. Even Martin Luther needed that reminder, so I think we probably do too. And so, oh my goodness, I could say so much more. The Sabbath, we're promised this rest. We are people who, in acknowledging that God is sovereign and knowing he's given us a job to do, can focus on that work without worrying about everything else because he is in control of it. And because of that, I can say, give up your striving and your resistance. If you're not a Christian, repent and believe. There is a sovereign king. The piper will come to be paid, and he's coming. So we have to repent and believe. He's sovereign. But he's not a tyrant. The moment you do, you'll find that you, you're all the striving. The Mary Piffer, I wish she would just accept the gospel. Judith, Judith Shulovitz, a fine Jewish woman, I wish she'd accept the gospel because she wouldn't have, she'd have more answers. All of us would. And if you're a Christian, rest in that fact. Begin to lay hold of that truth that you are not king, but God is, and he knows what he's doing. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> you are holy and good. You are sovereign. Thank you that you've given us work to do, that we're not just here to, like a, on a cruise to see our last days out. We're, none of us, if we are alive, Lord, we have been given a great task. I love that John is being told to go out and prophesy, and yet he's probably almost 100 years old when he gets this prophecy. So even as an aged man, he is still being told, you have a job to do. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you've done everything you can to remove those anxieties from us so that we can be focused on the task at hand, that we can worship and love even in the midst of chaos. Lord, it doesn't mean we rejoice in the suffering all the time, but we do look at it and we are changed in it. We don't despair like the world despairs. Uh, we thank you for the hope of the gospel. We pray all these things in your son's great and mighty and glorious and sovereign name. Amen. Now with that, the team's going to lead us in a song. It is communion day, and um, I'll come back to explain. You don't have your little cups and things, and we'll talk about that. But in the meantime, as the team is playing, I don't know if they're going to ask you to stand or not, but just reflect. The fact that every time we come to the table, this is a reminder to us that he has paid a price. It's a reminder that he has died, and therefore we have certain things that we can be certain of. And that, that's meant to preserve for us peace, to give us peace in a world that tries to rob us of it. So let's reflect on that as the team leads us. Um, just to sit in your chair, if you want to read scripture, if you want to pray, uh, if you want to listen, if you want to sing along, that's completely up to you, whatever prepares your heart uh, for communion this morning. the Prince of Glory died, my riches came, I count but loss and for consent on all my pride. See from his Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love meet, or thorns come close? So rich a crown. Were the
So we're, we're gonna, in a minute, we're all going to come up and we're going to grab the, get the elements here. But let me say one thing. In the historic church, what they would do right now is something called fence the table. And what they meant by that was they were going to the, the church, the pastor's job was to say, hey, if you're a Christian, if you believe and can assent to everything you've been hearing, Christ alone and so on, this table is for you. It's not Redeemer's table. It's God's table. So it doesn't matter if you attend here or not. You are welcome here if you are a Christian. And this is the fencing part. If you are not a Christian, then my response would be, don't bother coming up to the signs and seals and symbols of something that you don't actually have a real awareness of and a real relationship with. I would say, don't come up, because it's just going to be bread and juice to you. It is to us, but symbolically it's more, of course. So I would say, if you're not there yet, and you're not a Christian yet, you're on a journey, that's okay. Stay in your seat. No one's going to judge you. In fact, the opposite. We'll actually pray more for you, which is wonderful. So um, that's my word to you. Now, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be a little different. In a couple of months, we're going to start doing communion the old-fashioned way again, remember, with real bread and real juice? And we're going to have people coming up to do it. However, so to get us back in that habit, right now we only have the, the little packets. But we're going to start for the next couple of months coming up and receiving it, this act of coming up, taking one, and going back to your seat, and then partaking together. Because we want you to be uh, ready for it when we get back to the way things were. And as you do, we have a little infomercial up here behind me. I know, it's because it's confusing. It's simple. Exit to your right. Come to the front, and there's going to be an elder, uh, three elders, I think. Is that right? Three elders will be up at the end of the aisles where you come, and they'll, you'll get your, your communion stuff, and you will head back up the other side. So in a little right loop. Does that make sense from where you are? Oh, boy, is this going to be trouble? <laughs> uh, well, let's give it a try. And as we do, the team's going to lead us in a song. When you get your packet... Head back to your seat. I would even prep and pre-open it so we don't have the crinkling right all at once. Um, so do that and, um, and wait at your table, at your table, at your, in your seat. We want to take it together because this is, this is a, a ritual that Christ has given us, a sacrament. And the idea is not just that we are bound to him one-on-one, -on -one, but we are bound together. Like it or not, you and I are now brothers and sisters forever and ever. And this is a reminder that we are a family. We don't just leave when the preaching is not what we like or the music isn't what we like. This is a family. And so we want to partake together. So with that, the team will lead. Elders can come on up and elder couples and grab the spots. Thank you. And if you're unable to come up, uh, either someone beside you can bring it or just raise your hand and we'll bring it uh, to you as well. All right, right.
stand and we can continue singing. fitting last couple of lines we bear the cross and the cross is this message especially this bitter and sweet message we bear to the world which can be difficult at times but we do it in anticipation of a crown that we've been promised and so every time we gather to take this it's a reminder that the crown is certain it's not in the balance it is yours should you be a christian do you believe do you trust christ alone so and that's why on the night when he was betrayed paul tells us that he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. So let's take that together. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you. And let's take that together as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you that as, as Mary Piffer says, the world seems groundless. It seems like we're all free-falling and that we never know what new horror is going to come tomorrow. Um, and in the midst of all that, although we lament with the world and we weep with the world, we mourn and we often get caught up in the mess of it. Just because we may be forgiven of our sins doesn't mean we are exempt from feeling the effects of sin in the world. Our bodies break down, our families are robbed of us sometimes, our jobs, our health, our our peace of mind, everything. And Lord, it is you, you alone, that give us hope. You are the rock, our refuge. Lord, we run to you when the world is a mess. We run to you in all things. You alone are our refuge. Help us to not seek refuge in anything else, not our careers, our families, our work, nothing. Lord, those are good things, but we often make them ultimate things. Help us to not do that, Father. We thank you for the cross. Thank you for the assurance that we have that all these things, you won't just bring about good in, despite the evil. You're actually going to use the evil to make good. That's, we don't even know it. It's remarkable. Father, we thank you for that. I pray that all the world will come to bow at the feet of this great king that we love and serve. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have one more song, and then we will wrap things up. Yes. Let's sing these words together as we conclude this morning. We want to continue to just praise his name and sing who he is and with a thousand hallelujahs will magnify his name. Who else 
pray father um, with that in mind lord we are yours we've heard that throughout the, the verse through these songs lord send us we are we echo the prophet isaiah here we are send us lord we are yours you have every right to ask us to serve you because you have redeemed us it's free grace there's no greater gift you did for us what we could never do for ourselves so here we are send us individually and as a church as well lord help us uh, as a redeemer here to be not the, best city, not the best church in the city, but the best church for this city. Let us serve the world. Let us break our backs and spend everything in our tank to make you known in this wonderful region. God, you have called us here for this time. Um, help us, Lord. We believe. Help our unbelief. 
God, we know we're of dual nature. We've got this sinful nature still trying to, to get a better of us. God, forgive us when we stumble. Encourage us, encourage us as we seek to stand for you. And above all, um, have your will be done in us, in this church, and in this world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, we have a couple of quick announcements. You may be seated. That's, you can get a rest. A couple of quick announcements, and I'll come back and do the benediction. I'm going to invite Ben up. I should make you stand on the floor. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taller than him. It's got to be hard from down there to see. Oh, all right, all right. He's only, I mean, I'm, you're, I'm still one step higher than you. Anyway, so if you don't know Ben, you should, and Ben has got a quick announcement for us. So. Okay, so as Carl has mentioned multiple times, we are a large church family here at Redeemer, and one thing that's very important is staying connected with one another. So one thing that we've been implementing within Redeemer within the past year is something called Planning Center, which is a church management software um, that is used mainly on the admin side to organize and see who's coming to our church. However, there is a congregant side um, to Planning Center, and that's what you see on your main screen here. This is called the Church Center app. So there's many benefits to this app. I'll step down here. Um, and the major benefits are things like an online directory, so you can see everybody's contact information. And I know something, uh, sec information security is something that is desired for people, so you can actually select what you share with each other within Redeemer. Some other things that you can see is the calendars of what's happening at Redeemer, so if there's large-scale events, as well as any events that happen with your groups. So this could be community groups, any Bible studies. You can actually go on this app and sign up for those groups and see what groups are being offered. So when Carl now is going to have new classes coming in the fall, they'll be available on the app, and you can just simply sign up to those classes, and then you'll get targeted emails based on those classes, when they're going to start, as well as within your calendar, they'll actually pop up right in the app the dates and times that, of events that are happening. As well as if you volunteer at Redeemer, you will also see your schedule of when your rehearsal times are, when you're going to volunteer, and you can see everything throughout that. So what I've actually done is during the service, you actually would have got an email from me, uh, relatively recent, of how to download the app. And I know sometimes this can be a little complex of how to get started with this whole system. So what we have is we have our church interns here, the three of them, they are all around. They will be at the back of the church in the foyer after the service, and they will help you either install or log into this app so that you can get connected into the church. And throughout the RB Connect and other means of communication, I'll be sending out different videos of how we can better immerse as a family together using this app so we can be interconnected within Redeemer. And so if you have any questions, please see the interns or myself at the back, and we'd be glad to help you. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, and there's so much this, this can do. This little app, and I know not everybody loves phones, but little things, like we can send notifications to you if the service is going to be canceled or there's an urgent prayer request. We can send a notification directly to your phone that pops up. No more waiting to, for it to go to email. Um, as it says up there, when you have children, you can check them in from home. So when you get here, it prints off your little tag for you and you're ready. It's great. You can give all sorts of things and more and more as we go on. So it's a good tool. I know a lot of people want a directory. That's one of the things it does. It has all that there. So with that one quick announcement, or two, I guess, one, after the service, we're having lunch on the lawn, meaning we're going to hang out outside, eat lunch. I think we've provided ice cream. There'll be a bunch of ice cream out there for you. Um, so hang out, enjoy the summer, get to know one another, laugh, joke, talk about how profound the service was, um, and how tall Carl is. No, and then, um, and also, but, it, but really, if, if, if you have a prayer need, if something came up during the service, or you just have a need and you want prayer for it, please come up. We have a prayer team here. That they'll have a little lanyard that says prayer team, and they'll be waiting up front to pray with you. We want to make sure uh, you have that opportunity to pray. With that, stand up. Let's receive this benediction. Is it going to be, oh, it's going to be behind me only. Okay, I'm going to, I'll read it this way. No, I have to read it. So it comes from Numbers. We all know this one. The Lord bless, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And together we say, amen. amen. With that, we've come to an end of the service. Thank you so much. Go down in the grace and peace of Christ, and we'll see you next week.